The views expressed on the Final Straw Radio do not necessarily reflect those of Asheville FM, Friends of Community Radio, or any of the affiliates and radio stations airing the show. You're listening to WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina. This is the Final Straw, and I'm Bruce of Goodness. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. If you're interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment, you're free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. Those archives that are radio-friendly can be found in our collection at archive.org, and that is pointed to from our website. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. The show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee, located at 610 Haywood Road. Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events, at their website, firestorm.coop. This week, we're featuring two segments. The first conversation is with a supporter of Kara Wild. Kara is an anarchist a trans woman, an artist, and is currently incarcerated and awaiting trial in France for participation in the Nuit Debout protests that swept across France in 2016 against charge changes to labor laws in that country. More information on Kara's case can be found at freekarawild, that's K-A-R-A, wild.org. For links to the projects that Kara is being supported by, as well as some of her writings and Krem's address, check out the links in the show notes at our website, thefilestrawradio.noblogs.org. The second portion of the show, uh, we do something a little bit experimental. We present a conversation with a member of an anti-authoritarian movement in Europe. We don't say what movement. We talk about conflict internal to the movement, but we don't name the parties involved. The conversation was conducted from an anti-authoritarian perspective in the interest of supporting heterogeneous communities in struggle through the conflicts that arise internal to them. The purpose of this recording is to promote a mental exercise on the part of the listener to plug in their own experiences and movements with many different trajectories inside of them. The anonymous nature of the conversation was in part to not contribute to internal conflict in said movement or unsaid movement. Conflict is better addressed between the parties involved than with an outside party or radio show whose interests may not be the same as said movement or unsaid movement. I hope that this conversation is helpful for all of its purposeful vagueness. It's been a week and a day since the events in Charlottesville, and for me, it is a bit difficult to know what to say. There have been many excellent report backs from Soulcast, It's Going Down, the Crime Think X Worker podcast, and the Radical Underground podcast. Definitely check those out for in depth analyses and on the ground perspectives from anarchists and anti fascists. Since Seville, there have been very well-publicized resistances to fascism and ongoing white supremacy in Durham, Boston, and right here in Asheville, where four brave community members attempted the removal of a plaque commemorating Robert E. Lee at downtown's Vance Monument. These four folks put themselves and their safety on the line to fight white supremacy and racist revisionist history by engaging in this act. If you want to read a statement from these folks or donate to their legal fund, you can visit youcaring.com and search for Asheville Monument Removal Legal Fund. Activity seems relentless right now, with elements on both sides galvanized by recent events. Marches and calls to action are coming fast and furious. It is important to mobilize, but mobilize wisely, in the spirit of complete honesty about your capacities and energy. We cannot fight long-term unless we fight alongside all our comrades, support those who put themselves or are on the front lines, and help prioritize all levels of anti-fascist engagement and accomplish it. With that in mind, I want to say that if you are interested in keeping up with these calls for solidarity, keep your eyes on itsgoingdown.org for announcements and updates. One that I'd like to mention right now is a call for solidarity in Phoenix, Arizona. This is a, quote, call for an anti-fascist and anti-colonial contingent against Trump's rally on Tuesday, August 22nd at 6 p.m. at the Phoenix Convention Center. We will converge in the spirit of solidarity and hostility to the current order and as a physical body ready to act in self-defense and mutual protection of each other from cops, fascists, and liberal radical, quote, peace police, unquote. 
This rally is a reaction to Trump's sus- suspected decision to pardon former Arizona Shev- Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who was recently found guilty of criminal contempt for defying a state judge's order to stop traffic patrols targeting suspected undocumented immigrants. Those patrols were kept in place by Arpeo for 17 months after the order for their removal was issued. This same sheriff rose to infamy for his intentionally cruel and sadistic treatment of incarcerated people. This rally again will be held on Tuesday, August 22nd at 6 p.m. at the Phoenix Convention Center at 100 North 3rd Street in downtown Phoenix. It's recommended that people arrive and look for the black flags. For a complete anti-colonial, anti-fascist analysis of both the events of this day and the liberal reaction to it, you can visit It's Going Down and search for the call's title, which is Phoenix, Arizona, Call for an Anarchist, Anti-Fascist, and Anti-Colonial Presence Against All Presidents. On August 12th in Charlottesville, many IWW and GDC members from across the country were present. Members of the Metropolitan Anarchist Coordinating Committee, or MAC, uh, from New York City also had members present at the vehicular manslaughter that occurred that day. The NYC, GDC of the IWW, as well as MACC, stand in solidarity with all those opposed to growing, the growing wave of fascism around the world. Cowardly acts will only strengthen our resolve to fight back and defend ourselves. An injury to one is an injury to all. To support all those injured by fascist violence in Charlottesville, NYC GDC of the IWW as well as MACC are holding a fundraiser and screening of the latest episode of Trouble by Submedia at Rebecca's. Rebecca's is at 610 Bushwick Avenue in Brooklyn, and this will be occurring on Sunday, August 27th from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Trouble, if you're not aware, is a new monthly documentary series that broadcasts first-hand accounts of struggles for community self-defense. Previous episodes have explored topics like water protectors fighting the construction of the DAPL pipeline at Standing Rock, anti-fascist organizing, solidarity efforts for refugees and resistance to state repression. Submedia has encouraged groups to host screenings of the show to bring communities together and provoke discussion of tactics, struggles, and movement dynamics. The best defense against fascism is a strong and supportive community based on principles of mutual aid, solidarity, and self-defense. Heather Heyer will live in our hearts forever. And now a few words from one of our cohorts at the Channel Zero Network. Good morning, slaves. Looking for relief from the steaming hot plate of bullshit served up on the daily by the mainstream media? Are you thirsting for solid and reliable information to escape the mind-numbing vortex of corporate news and Trump tweets? Are you ready to check out every time you hear a Despacito on the radio one more fucking time? Then tune your dial to Sub.media, a mouth-watering hub of infotainment and subversion that'll make you want to quit your job and join the motherfucking resistance. Dive into our newly designed website and gorge yourself on one of the 500 plus videos and audio tracks from our vast library of anarchist films, hip hop and riot porn, or choose from one of our original shows, like Trouble, Burning Cop Car, A's for Anarchy, Video Ninja Reports, and The Stimulator. Fuck Netflix. Watch sub.media. Ohio Attorney General Mike DeWine, a longtime fascist, has announced his candidacy for Ohio governor in 2018. As I am also running, I sent Mike the following cordial letter, which he did not answer. I now share it with you. Dear Mike, I see that you and I are running for the same office. I write this to begin discussion on three issues I believe both of our campaigns will mutually find important. First, as a kind of gentleman's agreement, I hope we can come to a meeting of the minds that what matters are the issues affecting Ohioans and that we should refrain from personal attacks. To that end, if you would agree not to mention my sexual indiscretions, I will agree not to mention yours. Of course, my sexual indiscretions involve only myself. Despite what my mom said, I have not yet gone blind. But with the absence of any lubricant, it sometimes appears as though I attempted to cram my into a pencil sharpener. Regarding your indiscretions, if we come to terms, I will not post the video of you having intercourse with German shepherds behind the Masonic Lodge. Well, not so much video footage as it is a cartoon reenactment. 
but you get the idea. As a second matter, I would like to begin the process of my campaign and your campaign working out the details regarding the gubernatorial debates, how many, the dates, the rules, dress code, and whether there will be a talent or swimsuit competition. If there is a talent competition, I suggest we will need to get permits for the fire marshal. What I have planned is really badass, Mike. And if there's a swimsuit competition, I suggest that, again, we will need permits from the fire marshal. I'm that smoking hot in a two-piece. I'll need advance notice, though. I'll have to wax my back hair. As a final matter, please know that with each campaign, I challenge the other candidates to a wrestling match on pay-per-view. I suggest a no-holds-barred, no pinfall submission only tables, letters, and chairs Texas cage match. However, in this election cycle, I don't believe such a match would be fair. As I understand it, you're only about four feet tall, and you're about 80 years old. You remind me of a cross-eyed badger I once saw rummaging through my garbage. No offense. I'm sure badgers have some redeeming qualities, even though I can't think of any right now. At any rate, a match between you and I would be totally unfair. So, to give you a fighting chance, I'd like to provide you the choice of three options to level the playing field. One, you can join forces with whomever the Democrats nominate, and I will take on both of you at the same time. Or, two, we can include all candidates and our lieutenant governor picks and make it a real free-for-all. Or, three, you can include your wife and kids and give me an opportunity to beat up your whole family. But leave the dog and goldfish at home. I only believe in violence against humans. I hope one of these options is amenable to you, as the wrestling match is incredibly important. You'll recall Trump appeared on the WWE, but Hillary did not. You see how that ended, right? For my part, I want Ohio voters to see what I do to the other candidates, so they will know that I'm really serious about doing the same thing to the state government. Suplex from the top of the turnbuckle, Mike. boo -yow. Before I close, I should let you know that I have absolutely no involvement in any effort to get Russian hackers to interfere in the 2018 election for governor. My correspondence to staff counsel at the Embassy of the Russian Federation that announces my candidacy for Ohio governor and my plans if elected, and how the deliberate implosion of one of the 50 states would serve Russian interests, was in no way intended to get the Russian government to employ Russian hackers to throw the election to me. If anyone alleges otherwise, it's just a nasty rumor clearly designed to undermine the legitimacy of my election after I beat you hierarchs fair and square. I hope to hear back from you soon. If I don't get a timely response, I will approve the content of this letter for publication and broadcast. Freedom, Sean Swain. So, Mike DeWine has not responded. You can check out SeanSwain.org for a video of Mike DeWine's sexual indiscretions. Well, cartoon reenactment. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain for more on corruption in Lebanon, Ohio. Candidate for Ohio Governor in 2018. And I approve this message. You can write to Sean Swain at Sean Swain, 243-205, Warren C.I., P.O. Box 120, 5787 State Route 63, Lebanon, Ohio, 45036. Updates on his situation and more writings by Sean can be found at seanswain.org. We're speaking with a supporter of Carol Wilde. Kara is a trans woman from the USA, currently being held in a men's prison in France, so far for a year and finally facing trial in September. Thanks a lot for chatting. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Can you tell listeners uh, about Kara and how she came to be imprisoned in France? Yeah, so Kara is a force of nature. She's an artist, an anarchist, a squatter, and a witch. She was traveling overseas in... 2016 and through a series of unfortunate events ended up in Belgium and then traveled to France in late April or early May. There were a lot of uprisings going on at that time because there were some laws proposed there, some labor reform laws called Loi du Travail and those laws are basically similar to right to work laws and also took away the standard 35 hour work week where after that people would get overtime and the labor movements there are just like a lot more on their game. So when 
legislators tried to put through like this law that might not have been that big. They uh, showed a really strong force of resistance because they don't want their own autonomy and the workforce to be taken away. And um, there was this big uh, like response by both trade unions and student groups and revolutionaries. And the movement came to be known as Nuit Debut, which means up all night. And it was sort of similar to what we had in the U.S., of Occupy, where they were having really broad calls uh, against both the labor laws and the world that it represents. And uh, there were a lot of different actions there, and Kara happened to be present and ended up getting arrested and accused of being involved in an action that happened on the 18th of May in 2016, in which a cop car was smashed and then somebody threw a firework into the broken uh, back windshield, which caught the cop car on fire. And there happened to be two cops in the car when it set on fire. So you mentioned right to work laws, and that's something really specific to the U.S. Uh, Besides the changing of the hours of the work week, uh, do you know anything more about what the implications of the loi de travail, travail, sorry, my my French is horrible, what the implications would have been. And also, wasn't there something about the process by which they were being proposed or passed into law that was a bit screwy? Yeah, they were pushed through really quickly without, through like the lower levels of whatever their legislative process are without like votes so that they would go through. And as far as I understand, um, these laws, also known as the El Kochmi Bill, which is after named after the labor minister, Miriam El Kochmi, Um, these laws just make it easier for employers to treat employees as if they're disposable and um, just like sets it up better for them to make a lot of money. I'm looking over my notes. Yeah, totally. I know that like some of the, some of in the past there have been protests in France around employment uh, concerning age and the hiring of, Older people for jobs has been something that's kind of coveted um, because it it feeds more into employment, but also there's been like retirement after a certain age too. It seems like a really a really structured and probably because of like labor struggles, a really structured approach from post war France of employment and education for the general public that maybe neoliberal reforms are being implemented and destabilizing and creating like more precarity for the workers? Yeah, definitely a lot more precarity. And just people being treated like they're disposable, easier to fire. Um, And I know it affected overtime pay. And people probably heard about how a lot of the trade unions were really upset that, like, um, like, the trains got shut down and, like, Uh, different like oil refineries were shut down and stuff so it wasn't just like radicals getting involved it was like across the whole society i can't imagine what a labor a labor movement like that would be like in the united states yeah totally (laughs) um so so at this point in the story kara's been incarcerated and arrested and accused of of being involved in the smashing up of the police car. Um, uh, what what sorts of repression do trans prisoners face um, as opposed to cis prisoners when they're incarcerated? So cops love policing people's genders and misgendering trans prisoners, which is really terrible and dehumanizing because there's so much mutual hatred, but the cops, like the jail guards or prison guards have so much more power than inmates do. And also like in a, in a prison, I've heard that doctors, nurses, and psychologists have misgendered Kara and some of the other trans women there, which has felt almost worse because they're supposed to just like have more experience and be more educated. And also there's like internalized transphobia that Kara like sees in other trans prisoners. So she's in a block, like basically in solitary, 
with other trans women and she can go out for a certain amount of time every day to go into the prison yard and smoke cigarettes and exercise with other trans women and also they go to art class together and so even though they're all trans women like they have a lot of different political ideas and some of them are kind of terrible and have internalized transphobia themselves but it's also nice to be able to interact with other people and go to art class with them and Kara has had some friends there also, like, when you're supporting a trans prisoner, a lot of people, like, expect to know specific details about the person that you're supporting's, like, transition in their bodies in ways that that doesn't happen with cis people that I think is, like, really not okay. Like, people wanting to know, like, where a person is in their transition or what they're interested in that way. Yeah, that's a really good point. And so maybe as, like, a practical... Uh would you suggest something like if someone is deciding, we'll go more into writing to Kara later, um, but addressing that issue, can you talk about what a, and this, this goes for whether someone's inside or outside of prison. Um, what is a, like a respectful approach towards questions if you have them about someone's identity and what's important to know and maybe what's not important for you to know? Yeah. I think a lot of times people will just ask like, about a, like a trans person like has that person had bottom surgery yet as if that's an indication of whether they're like a legitimate woman or man or whatever they identify as and I like actually don't think that's anybody's a, I don't think anybody's entitled to have that information about another person and if they offer that information to you then I think that that's okay but in general I just think people should be okay not knowing that um that's like a question that I've gotten that like makes me feel really uncomfortable when I hear it and I don't know what to say. I'm just like, that's not your business. Yeah. And that seems like such a like straightforward thing to <laughs> like a reasonable approach of like, actually I don't feel like talking about my genitals. I hope that's okay with you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or somebody else's. But yeah, I think a lot of, a lot of cis people have a lot of, yeah, have have digested a lot of representations of trans identities through popular media or just don't don't know where to start and in having conversations and yeah, it's probably good for them to hear just like that's actually none of your business and focus on them as a person and just if somebody wants to use a pronoun like trust that that's the pronoun that they want to use and that's like fine. Yeah, exactly. Um, so although Kara was originally denied access to hormones in August of 2016, she was finally granted access, which is great. Um, what did that process entail and what impact have hormones had on Kara's experience while inside? So I'm not totally sure exactly how she started getting hormones. I think that they just like the prison started listening to all the kites that she was sending being like, I need to see the doctor. I need hormones. I had sent some paperwork uh, from the clinic in Chicago trying to like help her get information from that clinic to the prison to inform them of the dosages that she was on. I don't think that that really helped. I think that in general, like France likes to be perceived as a really progressive prison system. And so I think that other trans prisoners who are incarcerated with Kara have access to hormones. And so I think eventually they just listened and believed her. Um, also, I don't remember, there was like a lot going on for me at that time, but I think it's possible that people over there like advocated on her behalf. And I think actions were happening also around that, like calling for her to get hormones. Um, the dose there really is not good though. Like the doctors there are not endocrinologists and so Kara's excited to get out and be back on a dose that feels good for her. And can you can you say a few more words about what the um, frequently what sort of mental health uh, experiences people have being getting off of or being denied uh, the hormones? Yeah, 
I think that a lot of times for people who've been on hormones uh, and then being taken off of them cold turkey can cause a lot of intense like psychological dysmorphia, which is like a phenomena where somebody feels either physically in their body or mentally or emotionally that what's happening is not aligned with the gender that they identify with, if that makes sense. And so it can be really intense, like to the point of like feeling strong feelings of like self-hatred and suicide or just like feeling really disgusted with your body, sick to your stomach, that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, would you explain what CARE's visitation rights are like and the various groups in France that support her? Yeah, she gets visitors um, pretty regularly. There's one friend who's visited like every week for the last nine months or something. Uh, she can have visitors like up to five days a week, I think. And I think maybe four days a week, actually. And her lawyer can visit whenever they want. Um, if you're coming from France, then your visit is for 40 minutes. But if you're coming from the U.S. then or far away, you get a double visit of 80 minutes. And in the visiting room, it's like a room with two doors and a table with like four chairs. And there's like a hallway on attached that each door opens to that are separate. And you come in on one door and Kara comes in on the other. And... They're actually touch visits, which is really cool. Uh, there's a woman named Larissa who visits Kara pretty regularly, and she visits all of the trans women who are incarcerated at Fleury Mergi. And she's just like a volunteer, and her name is Larissa. And she's like previously brought Kara books. They read uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X together and talked about it. And she's just been like a really helpful supporter. Um, there's also a group called uh, Calmero, and they give Kara and Krem, one of Kara's co-defendants, who's another incarcerated anarchist that we should talk about, uh, they give both of them money every month for their commissary, which is really awesome, and people from that group will go and visit her uh, pretty regularly, like a couple times a month or once a week. And then uh, Acceptus T is another group that they were like one of the first groups that reached out to me to tell me that she'd been incarcerated um, in early June of last year. And they are a group that brings trans prisoners clothes because in France you can actually like wear your own clothes. There's not uniforms. And so... Yeah, they, for a while we were sending books to them and I think we still, people do still send books to them and then they pass them off to another supporter who brings them to Kara because they don't have a lot of capacity to bring her books. Uh, there's a lot of, it seems like she's got a lot of support, which is really good. Oh, there's another group that visits and is helpful too called Deaf Coal and they formed during the uprisings last spring and summer as a way to like help support all of the people who were swept up during the uh, Nuit de Beau. like no matter what to try to help people like not snitch and feel supported and they visit Kara pretty regularly also and do fundraising for the legal support help find lawyers and that type of thing that's a lot that sounds like kind of an awesome like series of projects that are that are supporting Kara and other prisoners um, in that scenario. As an artist, how is Kara's engaging? How is Kara engaging with her experience as a political prisoner? Can you briefly describe her style and what inspires her? Yeah, I'm really amazed by Kara's ability to maintain her curiosity, inspiration, and thirst for the world despite such terrible circumstances that she's living in. Um, she's inspired by the natural world. Uh, anarchy, thirst for liberation, different like romances and sweeties that she has. She loves everything, like a lot of things that start with the word, the letter W, like witches, whales, wolves, wilderness, whiling out. Um, she's been having really vivid dreams and she's started making these really amazing prayer candles, like paintings to go on, like the 
Catholic candles uh, that are called Kara's Witchy Woo Woo Candles. And soon those will be available online and at anarchist bookstores around who want to sell them. She's also made two zines that I was able to help her complete. One of them is called Railroad Art, Railroad Girls 2, which is a comic about riding trains and squatting and stuff like that. That's Railroad Girls 2, The Way It Felt. And then she made another zine called Cute Beasts versus the State, which is about uh, polyamorous relationships. And it's sort of like a personal zine. And so those are both really sweet and beautiful. And she's made some really cool posters uh, that are around circulating. And there should be like links up to them on her website when this is posted. Or do you know of any cases of a similar nature, such as like political in a foreign country flight risk, um, that precede Kara's case that could be a- that could act as a reference to sort of guide someone who's paying attention to this into what might come next or how how this case might go? Yeah, so there was a case that's sort of happening parallel to this one around the same time called in Aachen, Germany. It's a case where a bunch of different anarchist comrades were being charged with an international conspiracy to rob a bank. And some comrades from Barcelona were had their house raided and then were arrested under suspicion of their involvement in a bank robbery. Um, And so one comrade, Lisa from Barcelona, recently got sentenced to seven and a half years uh, in Germany, even though she's from Barcelona. Also, I think a comrade or two, some comrades from the, the Netherlands were arrested in that case, as well as some people from Germany. I think that this case is relevant because it's happening around the same time and it deals with like international anarchists getting really intense charges in relation to the terrible crimes that are committed against the people and the environment every day, you know? Um, And it's just like seven and a half years is a really long time for someone to be held in prison in another country. And so I think that that case both Kara's, Kara's case and their cases serve to like serve as like reference points for each other of like really terrible things that are happening that the state is doing to radicals right now. And so I guess like despite the significance of the fact that these are occurring in different places within Europe, within different nation states with their specific legal structures, that it is happening underneath the EU. And so there's probably got to be like some common standards between how law is applied and um, the way that people are either held or extradited, right? Yeah, definitely. It's similar and relevant in that like one of Kara's co-defendants, Damien, was released from Fiafi Mafuji and he was on a date with his uh, wife and she like became unconscious and he did something really out of the ordinary for him. He called an ambulance, even though he knew that it could be really dangerous for him. And then he got uh, beat up really badly and strangled to the point of blacking out. And when he came to, like, they were still beating him up because the cops recognized him from his involvement in this action. And, or that's what he said in his telling of it. And then they threw him in jail and left him there for 30 hours. uh, And he faced charges of contempt and rebellion just for like being, being uh, like accused of a crime. Yeah. Recognized or like accused of a crime. And so he was released, but now he's completely deaf in his right ear, which is really terrible. Are there clear differences that come to mind between the so-called justice system in the U.S. and in France based on your experience of Kara's trial and treatment? Yeah, there's quite a few big differences. There's not any habeas corpus in France. So a lot of like the average time someone will wait to be tried for an alleged crime is three to five years. And then after that, it's pretty much always appealed. And that's another two years for the appeal to go through. So that's a big difference. And that's sort of why Kara's been in prison since she was arrested last May instead of like 
in the US, you'd be in a jail. That's incredible. Um, That's got to be so destructive to so many people's lives. Yeah, totally. There's like a there's like 65,000 people in French jails and many of them are awaiting trial. But after if after 5 years awaiting sentencing, uh, you're declared innocent, then a commission assesses your damages and pays you for your time. Like they assess how much your life is worth that you lost and then they give you money. Yeah, la di da. <laughs> yeah. So like if Kara is sentenced to a shorter sentence than she's already served, she'll get a certain amount of money for every day that she spent in prison. Um, also, there's just like generally fewer people in French prisons because it's a smaller country and also the U.S. has so many people in prison. Um, like I said earlier, you can wear your own clothes, which is helpful in some ways. The prison that I went to was really accessible when I visited Kara on public transportation and like a lot of people were riding the bus there to visit their loved ones, which is a lot different in the U.S. where prisons are spread out and really far away from anything. Yeah, for sure. So what appears to be the next stage in Kara's defense and court process? So she was previously facing attempted murder charges along with all of her co-defendants. And recently those charges got dropped. She was also facing a, some sort of like conspiracy or gang charge, but that was also dropped. But uh, she's still charged with assault on the police officer and destruction of police property. And the investigation is over. So the trial will be in September, and the dates are set for that. It's September 19th through the 22nd. And when I asked this person, Andrea, who's like studying to be a law student and does a lot of stuff with deaf coal, if she'll be sentenced at the trial, Andrea didn't know. So it's kind of a bummer. Like, I'd like to know if Kara was being sentenced soon and, and she would too but it'll be a real relief for the trial to be over in general that seems like a lot of weight to hold I'm just waiting what support does Kara need from comrades on the outside and abroad and what sorts of solidarity has been expressed so far there's been a lot of solidarity from like banner drops to acts of sabotage people have burned buildings and said it was in solidarity with Kara uh, which is pretty impressive and People have talked a lot about having a call for action here in the U.S. and internationally to raise awareness about the trial coming up and to be in solidarity with Kara and the other anarchist prisoner, Krem. And so we should have a date set for that really soon. And always letters are really helpful. Kara has a lot of books right now and should be good on books if she gets out soon. But if she is sentenced to longer, then she's a really... Uh, thirsty reader and loves reading about history and radical histories and ecology and all kinds of things. Um, yeah. So how can listeners send uh, letters and books to Kara? Is there, are there like in the U S different prisons have different, different rules considering how items get in and where they where they're sourced from in terms of like being sent from publishers being soft covers if it's a pamphlet or something it can't have any staples in it there's very specific like you can't send in photographs but you can send in photocopies of photographs do those sort of restrictions apply in france do you know and can you give us uh kara's uh address yeah definitely so some of the things apply. She has to get soft cover books. Hardcover books are denied. Apparently, she can only receive five books at a time. Uh, she gets all kinds of radical literature. Like, none of it seems to be censored based on content. She's like, when I get the Earth First Journal, it seems light compared to the insurrectionary stuff I get from Greece. Um, That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And the Earth First Journal, I'm looking at it right now, and it has staples in it, and she gets it. So, And I've sent her zines with staples in it, and it hasn't been a problem. 
Uh, also, I've sent her drawings with color, and that seems to be fine. And people can just send her books directly from their house or whatever, but I encourage people to not send more than, like, five books because I've had big boxes sent back, which is really disappointing because it costs so much to send them. Uh, and, yeah, I've sent her used books, which is pretty cool because you can get so many decent used books for really cheap. Did you find the address per chance? Yeah, it's... Um, should I, like, read it and also spell it out? That would be oh, awesome. Just, okay. So it's Bro David Kara number 428682, and that's spelled B-R-A-U-L-T, comma, David, spelled traditionally, and then Kara, K-A-R-A, number 428682. And then the next line, Ma de Fleury, 7 Ave de Plepure, which is M-A-H space D-E space F-L-E-U-R-Y comma 7 Ave, A-V-E space Des, D-E-S space P-E-U P-L-I-E-R-S Next line, 91705 Fleury-Mergie F-L-E-U-R-Y M-E-R-O-G-I-S comma Sedex, comma, France. And Sedex is spelled C-E-D-E-X. And France is just spelled how we spell it in English. And all that, again, will be on the blog post and in the show notes. So if you didn't catch all that, it'll be, it'll be written out. Um, in these last couple of minutes, can you tell us a little bit about Kara's uh, co-defendant, Krem? Yeah, Krem is a comrade who was arrested in February, I think, early February, and his squat was raided and the police like took their group computer and broke a bunch of stuff. And then a couple of days later, or that day, actually, I think Krem was arrested and charged with being the person who threw the firework into the cop car that ultimately set it on fire. And he's been held ever since. And he's just another anarchist who has been incarcerated that whole time. And he's the only person who's been arrested in relation to these charges who, besides Kara, who's still incarcerated. And so I think it's really important to give a shout out to him. And if people want to write him a little note, he doesn't speak much English, but he would love to receive support and solidarity from the U.S. as well. Great. Thanks so much, Bruce. Of course. Thanks a lot. And now an uncomplicated conversation about conflict and movement. So I was hoping that you could speak a little bit to experiences that you have of um, inside of the movement that you're involved in or in political space, uh, difficulties coming up or stoppages in communication between yourself and others or in, in processes, whether it be individuals or groups that you think make, make working together difficult. I don't know if there's any mm -hmm. things that come to mind first, or if I should ask a better question than that. <laughs> um, one thing uh, pops in my mind is um, the question of time. Um, here I see um, a big difference between people uh, in terms of um, the question of efficiency and the time we, we take to take a decision or make a project and often um, people um, use the excuse of emergency to to go quick to take decision only by few people and and then other people that were not involved into the decision into the process they are asked to be part of the project but only when everything is decided and uh, I feel like um, this is always like people always 
reproduce the same thing because of emergency. So is that like that's making a decision before before people get together sometimes and then just going to the meeting with a, like either not not so much proposal but a conclusion. Yeah, the I see the the big uh, assembly, not as a place where you discuss, but a place where some groups arrive with a a decision or project they discuss only among them, and you don't have the time as individual to think about it, to think about other ideas. So at the end of the meeting, everybody, the people they ask, is there any idea for this moment to make a something different but you didn't have the time to think about it or to feel confident enough to expose your own ID. So at the end it's their project of the people that decided before or talk about it before into groups that are the one that happen. Is that the kind of dynamic that could be changed if if um, a project wanted to if someone wanted to come up with a general um, uh, agenda beforehand, like give space and time a few days before and say, hey, so we're going to formulate things to talk about or proposals at the meeting, we're going to give this much time for like 15 minutes to talk about this, bring your proposals, mm -mm. 15 minutes to talk about this problem or this project, bring your proposals. Does that sort of thing happen in the assembly or is it less organized than that? It's less organized than this. Uh, you know that there's going to be an assembly every two weeks or every month, but um, the subject of the assembly sometimes is, uh, is said in advance, sometimes not. So you can, if you know in advance the sh subject, maybe you can organize to think about what you want to do. But it's not that easy to put people together and find what you want to do. Do you think that when you experience that, that's because people are trying to push them th something through the process, or because they literally just thought about it beforehand, or like a, a weakness in their communication strategy? Maybe a mix? Yeah, sure it's a mix, but uh, I see I see often people that they want to push something, they have an idea, or uh, a common view of what should be the struggle here and what is strategic or not, what is good or not for the struggle. So it's in a in a bigger at a bigger scale. It often respond to their way of imagining what is strategic, what is good. Do you imagine that the people that push through things don't trust? the thinking of the other people in the assembly or just view themselves as b having a different political perspective and so in competition and that's why they push it through or uh, is it simply maybe for in terms of efficiency and we have a really good idea and no one's going to disagree mm. with this so we just need to make a quick decision mm, I feel it's a bit uh, paternalistic it's a bit like um, here it's really difficult to have a common decision because so many different ways of thinking. So at some point we need to, if we want to do things here, we, we assume that some people need to take the power in, in some... It's too complicated here to do with everybody. We agree on the same strategy us as a group. And we assume we take uh, we push to our decisions, and if you want to do the same, you can do it. Actually, it's not really the case if you want to do it as they do, um, and if you are anti-authoritarian, you can't compete because you don't want to make a close group that uh, nobody knows about, a close group with many people with lots of privileges like class privilege, people that went to school, uh, high. Uh, high level of school, um, people that are no problem with money, no problem with alcohol. Um, so actually if you want to do the same in a more horizontal and anti-authoritarian way, it's not possible. Can you talk about 
uh, other dynamics that make it easier for people to take advantage of a stage or of a platform during discussion and debate, so that, like education and, and access to money mm-hmm. or things, I would imagine, and I, coming from a different society, but mm-hmm. also a patriarchal society, I understand like gender often has mm-hmm. to do, like, uh, yeah, being male assigned, being cisgender, like, as you identify, or mm-hmm. identifying as you were assigned at birth. Mm-hmm. Um, is that something that you experience, like a level of comfort with taking space because of that? Yeah, I, I in in the group I'm thinking of uh, the majority of people are male assigned people, uh, valid people, uh, people with the capacity to go to many meetings, capacity to write texts. Sometimes it's one person writing text and then saying this is collective when it's not. Uh, and in during the meeting or assembly. Um, it is not the same when this is this kind of person that are quite confident and we are used to listen to because of their gender and their role in the in the community their voice is uh, much more mm, listen or taking into account that when for example you are not in this uh, category and uh, for example if you want to be here the same way as a woman you have to speak loudly and uh, people think you are aggressive or stuff like this um, and it's much more difficult that your voice is the same importance does um, does ethnicity or nation of origin have any play in the dynamics too or access to language ease of ease of speaking language yeah yeah, um, for sure, um, the question of uh, ethnicity plays a role. Here it's majority of people are white people or European people. And uh, I think it's not that easy for people seen as not white. It's a bit complicated because the majority of people are white here. But in the groups that are having much power in their ha- ha- hands, no, I don't know. It's complicated. And the question of language um, is really important. The words you are able to use, sometimes text, they are written by this group of people. The vocabulary is really like high level of language. And if you don't understand, you don't feel that this text is for you. So it, it makes a yeah, barrier between people that who is con- uh, concerned by this text or proposal and who is not part of this. Has have these criticisms been uh, brought up to the group of people you're talking about, saying like, here are some, like, have they been willing to hear feminist critiques, for instance, or class critiques mm. of how they take space or how they engage with the rest of the. Uh, about feminism, there have been criticism and there have been an important moment where this group of people um, wrote a text about uh, women saying um, that women, they just have to take the power as well and they they just have to be as strong as men. And there was a big, big event and people after this realized how authoritarian this kind of group can be and I think they are able to hear the critics and change before it's too too big um, but often the if you critic this organization you can they would say that you are anti everything against everything that this is kind of a complotism um, like, tip, this is only in your imagina- imagination, and you want to just be crit- critic to be critic, or um, that you are so radical and so anarchist. But here, it's the real world, and the real world, you have to fight and you have to be strong, and we don't have the choice. Sometimes we have to be strategic and go quick. So. Um, at the moment, we try to have 
there has been lots of critics and some people that try to visualize this organization and the power they have in their hands and there are more and more discussion about it and uh, maybe there will be a change but since since now all the time it's uh, deny deny of the power domination people taking power and domination people try try not to see it or don't see it really do you think that the group is being strategic is like approaching these critiques methodically or like looking at them and saying okay somebody has proposed this critique how do i step around it like i know that some people for a long time for instance like it's so for me to hear feminist critiques has taken time mm -hmm. um, because society teaches me to think in a certain way yeah. and so i need to have conversations to be like oh i see i didn't realize i was doing that mm. and that takes a lot of patience from people um but do you think that this is like uh, a part of a strategy or in this group i see that people are quite different and it's not uh, it's hetero heterogeneous group mm -hmm. uh, some people they really think uh, they want to do things here and this is the way but they don't see how this means that many people are out of the that it's not so easy for other people to join this group if they are not uh, v valid if they are not uh, middle class if they're not uh, if they don't have to do something in this in this group um, if they don't slow the process, things like this. And other people, I think, not the majority, they really think in terms of strategy, in terms of um, maybe party, party style of politics. And sometimes I see that they come and they just listen to our critics, to to take them into a, into account and they will never like if you talk with some people for one or two hours they will not change their way of thinking at all but they will listen they will they would listen and listen and listen to have all the informations they need to see what is the opposition of their way of, the their way of doing do you see any options moving forward to to address this and uh, this dynamic and change it or block them from doing this sort of thing? Um, I think to visualize it, to visualize that this kind of group exists, um, what it means for in, in terms of uh, power concentration and to talk with people that are close to this group or inside this group person to person like you you said before but feminist christian to talk about anti-authoritarian and um, like to think together this is possible too and some people personally i don't want to talk with them because uh, i'm not confident enough with them to talk with so I don't know what to do else, but I think if more and more people are aware, we, I believe we can change something and change something in the structure of the community that it's not possible that few people have so much uh, power in their hands about communication, relation with media, money, um, the f the fact to be able to, to say what happened here, what is interesting or not, what is good or not for the struggle. So it's something we need to discuss at many people, but the first step is to visibilize and talk with people around us about this. Those are about the points that I was thinking of addressing. That's about what I had. Okay. Yeah. Is there, are there other points that I didn't ask about that you'd like to um, get out or that have been on your mind? Um, something special here is that we all live in the same place. Maybe 200, 300 people and there is lots of uh, the question of uh, relationship between people and this is what 
make us really strong because we we do many things together if even if I don't agree with you uh, in during the meeting uh, the day after we will uh, make some agriculture together I don't know what so this make us really strong but the other thing is that um, the conflict is something we are afraid of we are afraid that that we're not gonna get along if we talk about conflict we're not gonna get along good anymore and uh, it's like pay social um, social peace we, we need to keep good relationship and uh, so we're not we are afraid to go too far into the conflict and we prefer to look somewhere else and go on like this and uh, I don't know if it's special here but I see it a lot in like, as a barrier to to talk about conflict and, and all this so like what you said what you said with individuals someone else that I talked to had, had brought up that same point of um, that it's difficult it's difficult conflicting with people who you share space and struggle with yeah um, because you don't want it to become war yeah because then it's easy to escalate and then not only because of the toll that it has on the individuals involved but also mm -hmm. because for factions to go to war with each other within a movement, the movement collapses, yep. and then people are damaged for the rest of their life. Also, mm. do you see that there's a a non-lethal way of engaging? Just the one-on-one -on -one conversations about when you do this, it makes me feel this way, and here's what I think about how you're mm. doing this. That's would that be the solution? I guess that you see, or mm. I think. Um I see a lot question of ego, like people um, here are really like egocentric or not thinking collectively and uh, not putting them um, self conscious of their privilege and what the space they take and the violence they can be for other people. And um, I think uh, we need a lot of uh, the capacity to listen to people and take as much time as they need and this is what I think we like this here and uh, yeah, the conflict can be something really interesting and we really see it as something terrible mm. so this is kind of imaginary around conflict that that is terrible and this is war when mm. just people don't agree and this is politic and this is interesting and it seems really important to if things are going to move forward because you the project, the struggle that you're in right now, or the movement, isn't in a state of war immediately mm -hmm. at the moment, no. like it has been in the past, but it seems like if it's, not that the idea of like a peace at all costs internally is a good idea, people are going to disagree, like you mm -hmm. said, because yeah. it's heterogeneous, and people need space for that, for conversations and for disagreement, but if the state comes in and tries to evict again or yeah. if something big happens since elections are coming up for instance mm -hmm. and people are conflicted internally it seems like it's easier for everyone to be broken yeah yeah, yeah for sure thank you very much thank you. The views expressed on the Final Straw Radio do not necessarily reflect those of Asheville FM, Friends of Community Radio, or any of the affiliates and radio stations airing the show. You're listening to WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina. This is the Final Straw, and I'm Bruce Guinness. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. If you're interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment, you're free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. Those archives that are radio-friendly can be found in our collection at archive.org, and that is pointed to from our website. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. The show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee, located at 610 Haywood Road. Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events, at their website, firestorm.coop. 